Good evening. It's time to get started. Got a few announcements before we get started. If you're visiting with us, we're honored to have you here with us tonight, and we hope that you'll stay long enough for us to get to know you. And if you would, take a visitor's card, fill it out, and simply give it to one of us as you leave tonight. On the announcements, we've got some sick that weren't on the, in the bulletin or on the screens. Preston Grover will be undergoing tests tomorrow. Anita Peebles will be having foot surgery tomorrow. Allison James is still home sick. Dean Couch is in the Decatur Morgan Hospital with pneumonia. Addie Anderson is home sick with strep. Stanley Alexander, which is a friend of Willard Tucker, is in Riverside Assisted Living in need of our prayers. And good news, Ava Job, a friend that was attending CYC with Lauren Hamby, was baptized last night, so let's welcome her into the fold. That's all we have on the sick, on the events. Uh, tomorrow, of course, the meal delivery at 4 p.m., and men's class will be here at 6.30 p.m. This Wednesday night, the ladies' Bible class will resume. They will be continuing the book, Daughters of Eve, and if you need a book for that, it says see Kelly Barker. And... They will begin with Lesson 13. A Midway Ladies Retreat has been planned for April 17th and 18th. There's an information sheet on the table in the back of the auditorium. If you have questions, please see Bertha or Karen. Also for the A and B groups tonight, there are new lists in the back. If you didn't get one this morning, we have redone those lists to kind of even up the groups with the changes that were going to start taking place tonight. So if you didn't get a list this morning, uh, as soon as services is over, go ahead and get a list so you can see which way uh, you're put in the group. Harry Hames uh, dropped off some little donation cards. This is one of them right here. My wife's got them and she's going to place them on the, the tables in the back. And what they are is for quarters. And what this is, is cord, of course, is for the kids at Haiti. And it amounts in quarters to $10 if you fill one of these up. And according to Harry, that will feed a child for an entire month in Haiti. So if you're interested in making donations for that, please pick up one of these cards in the back. Our opening prayer tonight will be led by Brother Roger Thomas. And James Rogers will have our song leading. And Brother Bill Vandiver will have our closing prayer. Now let's join in our worship. <coughs> Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank thee for this day you've given us, this beautiful Lord's Day. We pray that our worship will accept this morning. We pray that now that we will put forth a good effort and we will pay attention and learn and be a better Christian after we, this service. We thank thee for Christ who came and suffered, bled, and died on the cross that we might have remission of our sins and we can have that hope of heaven in the future. We pray that you will be with those that are sick, those as Ken's mentioned here tonight, and those in our neighborhood that, that we know this and sick. We pray that you'll be with these people and bring them back to much wanted help. We pray that, Father, that you'll be with our missionaries we support. We pray that you'll be with us as a missionary every day as we go on about this back to Bible course that we will, we will 
make opportunities, have opportunities to work with people to help bring them to be a Christian. Pray, Father, that you will be with us as in our everyday lives as we try to bring others to thee. And pray that be with those that can't help themselves, those that's weak and old and feeble, that we will try to help these people as we can. We pray for gifts for our sins. We often do say things that we shouldn't do. We pray that you be with us in everything we do that's helping thy kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 106, all hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs> all hail the power of Jesus' name, the angels prostrate all, bring forth the to mansion.
The invitation song at the close of the lesson will be, let's see, number 590, Just As I Am. And before the lesson, we will sing number 242, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Let us stand as we sing. <clears throat> Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies to his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of all. Good evening to everyone. One thing we need to know as we seek to share the gospel is that sharing the gospel is not just for preachers. Preachers ought to be sharing the gospel, but we read also in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, that those that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now that has to mean a lot more than those involved in the Lord's work full time. The Lord has always intended that His people share the good news of salvation. And that's why we are going through these little booklets on Sunday evenings is to give us some tools to help us to do uh, just that. Now, in your red booklet, please uh, turn uh, to page 5 and notice one particular thing. In your book on page 5, you'll see the big letters, What Must I Do to Be Saved? What Must I Do to Be Saved? 
And you'll, then you'll see some questions underneath that. When you are studying with someone and you get to this point, first of all, you've got to take a deep breath and tell yourself to be patient and trust in the Lord. Because if you've been able to have someone sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and get to this point, then your blood begins to pump a little faster and you're thinking, okay, uh, we're getting close here. But you must be patient. You must be really patient to make sure that they are, that your partner uh, is uh, grasping uh, the reality of what they need to know. So we must be patient. Now these questions right here under what must I do to be saved, these are not to be answered uh, right now. When you get to this part in your booklet, we're not, we are not answering these questions, but these are questions to pose because the, the material that comes after this will answer most of these questions. But you want your, you want your partner at the table to, uh, to read them and to think about them. So you give a, few, a couple of moments of silence. Say, you know, take a look at these questions and ask yourself, are you saved? And then ask yourself, how are you saved? And then think about that. And then at what point in your conversion experience were you saved? And then let... Let some thought be given to that. Have you been baptized? Was that part of uh, your uh, conversion experience? And then the next page, on top of page six, were you baptized by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion? You're not answering these questions right now. You're just you're getting these uh, questions into the thoughts and the hearts. And then the last question there: Were you saved before, or after, or you were baptized? Now. The verses that are following will answer uh, most of these questions, and so you just want these questions to be in the mind of your hearers at that point. Okay, and so this is where uh, we'll get started. The first part of book three deals with our spiritual condition. Our spiritual condition. At some point uh, on the screen uh, tonight, there'll come up a little blurb that will say, a person must understand that they are lost first. We do not baptize saved people. That is, that is as fundamental uh, uh, with the Bible as you can possibly be. We do not baptize saved people. Baptism is not for saved people. Baptism is for those who know that they're lost. They're convinced that they're lost. So the first part of our red booklet was, uh, where are you at spiritually in your relationship with God? And then the second part of the red booklet was God's justice. God, God's right to judge us and even condemn us because of our sins. And then the hope also that God provides through that uh, in the cross of Jesus Christ. And that brings us down now to um, the conditions of salvation. The conditions of salvation. And before we get into these, let me just say a word or two. Uh, this word is fine. God does have conditions for salvation. But you want to think more in terms of responding to God's love. That's what... That's what the conditions of salvation is about. We've seen our spiritual condition. We've seen that without God's great love and mercy through the cross, we would be hopeless. And so now in response, in loving response to His love, then what would the Lord have me to do? In Titus chapter 3, for instance, uh, verses 3 through 5, uh, Paul says, Now, we're saved not by works of righteousness which we have done ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of water, by baptism, and the renewing from the Holy Spirit. But still, this is not something that we're doing as mere conditions that have been dropped down from heaven per se. But rather it's a response to what the Lord has done for us in providing salvation through his son. Okay. And so these are what these, uh, the conditions is what this is about, the response to the Lord's uh, love. Our religious friends uh, love to say, well, Jesus paid it all at the cross, and so therefore man is simply passive when it comes to salvation. And that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, yes, Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross, but we are active in that salvation. That's why God has, has placed these conditions uh, before us. Okay. And so let's think about that. Notice uh, here in John 
uh, chapter 3, this condition. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so here's the question. The condition stated here is what? Okay. Believing. Okay. And then, again, Jesus says in John 8 and 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. And then the question is this, will you be saved if you do not believe in Jesus? Okay. That's enough. Next condition, uh, Acts 17, verse number 30. Paul, as you remember, in the city of Athens, and he comes to uh, this conclusion. He says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere uh, to repent. So the condition stated here is what? Repentance. And so your partner there at the table, and you're, you're simply letting this uh, be answered, and you're not really uh, saying a lot uh, up to this point. And then... Further on repentance, uh, this passage is brought out, which is a very good one to uh, consider. Paul's uh, statements in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. He says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive um, damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. Okay. So the question is this, is merely being sorry for your sins the repentance that God has in mind? Okay, no, not being just sorry. Okay. Does repentance demand that the sinner turn from his sins? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now while you're at that passage, you'll notice there are two different kinds of sorrow Mention. Now, what I like to do right here is uh, tell me the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And just let whoever you're sitting down with, let them answer that. They'll answer that. They'll say, clearly, worldly sorrow is, is the kind of, of repentance you do because you've either been caught or the circumstances just causes you to stop doing what you're doing. But you're not doing it because you respect and love God and have listened to Him. You're doing it because the circumstances in your life just tell you to do it. And they'll answer that uh, for you. But it's a good one to see the, both the godly sorrow and the worldly sorrow in 2 Corinthians 7. So there's a condition of uh, repentance. Jesus comments on this also in Luke 13, verse 3. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So will you be saved if you do not repent? All right, no. And so uh, he finishes up then his... Um, his verses on repentance. And then he goes to the next one here, Romans 10 and verse 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so the next condition stated here is what? Confession. confession. And sometimes I'll stop right here and say, well, what does it mean to confess something? And the basic idea is that you are agreeing to something. You're, you're saying the same thing that someone else has said. You're confessing something. You're confessing something that is true. The good confession is a huge step in the direction of being saved. When you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you are stating that in your heart and with your life and with your lips that you believe all that goes with the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That's a huge commitment. And so the good uh, confession. And so Paul brings this up in Romans chapter 10 and verse uh, 10. And Jesus comments somewhat on this in Matthew chapter 10, 32 and 33. Where he says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so the question is simply this. Will you be saved if you do not confess Jesus? So what would you put there? So no. Another good passage there that I really like is 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12 where Paul to Timothy says, Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
I just love that statement. And Paul is reminding Timothy of the courage he needs and he takes him back to his conversion. conversion. Timothy, do you remember you made the good confession before many witnesses? So you need to retain that courage and have more courage as, as time moves on. Paul was looking at a time where he would eventually not be there and Timothy would have to gain more and more uh, courage. So 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. <clears throat> and then this passage about the conditions uh, for salvation. Man is active in his salvation. Peter says, The light figure wherein to even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The condition stated here then is what? Okay. Notice Jesus again in John 3 and verse 5. <coughs> Jesus answered, speaking to Nicodemus. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Will you be saved then if you are not baptized? And of course, putting that verse there implies, and certainly the Bible teaches, that when Jesus said, when we're born of the water and the Spirit, that means that we have listened to the Spirit's instruction given to us in the New Testament. And we're responding to that instruction uh, by being baptized in water. Okay. So just, just like that. Notice uh, in Mark 16, 16, we all know what Mark 16, 16 says. He who believes and is baptized uh, shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall be uh, condemned. But um, what the writer of this booklet wants us to think about is that many will... Read this passage like this first statement on top. The first statement up here says, He who believes is saved and then baptized. So many in our surrounding world read Mark 16, 16 just like that. Okay. And oftentimes, when you have gone through this process, and it's very important to start way back at the authority of Christ, and the importance of the Word of God, and the importance of the New Testament, and the importance of the Lord's Church, and the importance of our spiritual condition, and of Jesus' death on the cross, and God's justice that must be satisfied. All of that, it's important to go through all this. When you get down to this, and people are with you, and they're reading this, they will take a second and third and fourth look at this passage, because they have never read it, the way it should be read. Most read it like that, where the check mark is. He who, believes and is. he who believes is saved and then baptized. But what it actually says, of course, he who believes and is baptized uh, shall be saved. And so, kind of emphasizing that, and here you go, on Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not uh, believe shall be damned. Jesus said we must do what? We must believe and... Be baptized. And then this illustration, kind of an analysis of Mark 16, 16, just to kind of impress it upon us. Maybe you would insert these words, he that eats and digests shall be saved, but he that eats not shall be condemned. Many times your religious friends will say, see, at the end of that verse uh, says, if you do not believe, you'll be condemned. But of course, we understand that belief comes before baptism, but that does not eliminate the necessity of baptism. So maybe this little emphasis helps us to understand that. You've got to eat first and then digest, or, uh, but he that eats um, shall not be condemned. Okay. And so he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Yeah, yeah, please. When we start back on page five under, you said, what must I do to be saved? Did I understand you to say that, that you were asking those questions at that time, but they weren't answering them, they were just thinking about it? Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, to start, to start. I was doing down there during our study with the man who was here, that you wanted them to specifically answer those very clearly in their experience. Mm -hmm. So when you studied with them, and they understood the truth, they could go back and compare it to their experience. Right. 
And in particular, that's why I'd ask, were you saved before after you were baptized? Right. But if they said before, then you, after the study, you could say, you know, you said before, but now, you know, can you see what you... So right. Maybe that's... Right. Well, let me clarify. What I, what I was trying to say was basically the same thing. You want them to to sit there and you want them to look at that and even write it down. My experience is they won't write anything down. They're very uncomfortable with with this. They're not really sure that they should go ahead and say anything right here. They're not really sure that they should write anything right there. And so the ones I have sat down with, they will just kind of stare at it. But I want them to take that time to contemplate all of that. But what I was saying earlier was not at, at that point of the lesson, I'm not going to start bringing up different verses. I'm going to let that play out the way the booklet plays it out. But if they will write, you let them write. Sure, yeah, let them write. Yeah, so I was just going off my experience. But sure, if they will begin to write, then sure, give them all the time they need to write. Right. Good. Good, good thought. All right. Continuing on the uh, condition of uh, baptism, Acts 2 and 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy uh, Spirit. The inspired preacher uh, told these believers to do what two things? Repent and be baptized. Okay, repent and be baptized. Repentance and baptism are for what? Okay, very good. And he throws this up here to uh, kind of uh, repent on one box car and be baptized on, on the other box car to show that both repentance and baptism are for the same purpose, for the remission of sins. Both go in the same uh, direction. Okay, we're not repent, we don't repent uh, for one reason or baptize for another reason. We repent and be baptized together for uh, the remission of sins. Okay. All right. Still speaking of um, the condition for salvation, he will now begin to impress upon us the importance of being in Christ. So let's notice that for uh, just a couple of minutes. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. And so are all spiritual blessings in Christ, yes or no? Yes. If all spiritual blessings are in Christ, are there any spiritual blessings outside of Christ? There are no spiritual blessings outside of Christ. And then further on this idea, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, Therefore, Paul says, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And so, is salvation in Christ? Yes. Salvation is said to be in Christ. Okay. So is it your understanding that one must be in Christ to be saved? Okay. And that would need to be Yes. Then, further along this point, he gives uh, this quick illustration of how many things are said to be in Christ uh, as far as the New Testament is concerned. Faith is said to be in Christ, Galatians 3.26. Grace, according to 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. Of course, salvation, we just said. Ephesians uh, 1 and verse 7 says that forgiveness is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. The truth, according to Romans 9, verse 1, the truth is in Christ. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Those who die in the Lord are those who are blessed, Revelation 14, 13. Also add there, 1 John 5, 11, that says eternal life is found in the Son of God. So all these spiritual blessings are found in one place in in Christ. Okay. And so on the side there you see that we're going to be looking at passages like Galatians 3.27 and Romans 6, 1 through 5, 5 that speaks about being baptized into Christ and being buried with him by baptism. So we'll get uh, to that. Notice Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized, notice this, have been baptized into Christ, have put on 
Christ. How does one get into Christ? He is baptized. <clears throat> and we're remembering that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 5 says, There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And so is there more than one valid baptism in God's will today? No. Since God accepts only one baptism in his will today, must we be careful to be sure that we're baptized in the way God says uh, to be baptized? be a big yes on that. Okay. So those are some good comments from Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, verse number 5. And then uh, from there we go to Acts 8 and the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Notice that um, concerning Philip being there with him, he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Did Philip baptize the eunuch in water? And did both Philip and the eunuch go down into the water? Yes. Okay. Yes, again. All right. More questions on Philip and the eunuch. Would it have been necessary for both Philip and the eunuch to go down into the water if sprinkling or pouring uh, were the one baptism of God's command? Right. It would not have been necessary for both of them to go down into the water if they were going to sprinkle or pour. But would it have been uh, necessary for both Philip and the unit to go down into the water if immersion is the baptism that God uh, commands? Yeah. You can also put the word sprinkle or pour in the place of baptism there in Acts 8. We both went down into the water and Philip poured him. I know it makes sense, does it? Or put sprinkle in there. They both went down into the water and Philip sprinkled him. Okay. Notice that only immersion makes good sense with what is said there in Acts 8. Again, 1 Peter 3.21 is brought out concerning the condition for salvation. The light figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience uh, toward God uh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the one baptism, must there be an answering, the answering of a good conscience toward God? Can a baby conscientiously accept baptism as a command of God? That's a good question to ask right there. The candidate for baptism, as our booklet has brought out, has understood his or her spiritual condition. And that creates within them a bad conscience. Their conscience is bothering them. It's aching. What can they do? What can they do to help this situation? What's the remedy? Well, Peter says that baptism is a big part of that appealing to God. I like the word appeal a little bit better than answer here. That appealing, I'm appealing to God. In my submission to Him, I'm appealing to Him for that good conscience. I want that good conscience. Is baptism a part of the process of being able to receive that good conscience? And Peter uh, definitely says that it is. Another passage to consider in, in relation to this is Hebrews 9 in verses 13 and 14 constant comparisons as you know in the book of Hebrews between the old covenant and the new notice this statement <clears throat> Hebrews 9 13 and 14 for if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctified one for the purification of his flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, to purify, notice this, to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What is it that purifies our conscience? The blood of Christ. 
Where do you contact that blood? Well, notice what Peter says. Peter also throws in the fact that baptism is a part of receiving that pure conscience. So which is it? Is it the blood of Christ or is it baptism? It's both. Okay. We are active in the salvation that God has brought our way through Jesus. This from Romans 6 in regard to the condition of baptism. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Don't you love that? Verse 5. Romans 6, verse 5. When we're baptized, we are planted together with Christ. You know, Galatians 3, 27. We put on Christ. When you're baptized into Christ and you put on Christ, what? What is the situation if you do not, if you are not baptized into Christ? Well, the opposite of that is you don't put on Christ. If you're not baptized for the remission of sins, then you're not planted together uh, with him. So notice this question. Does the Bible describe the one baptism as a burial in water? Yes, yes it does. Okay. <coughs> and give this picture. Uh, he calls this uh, the gospel enacted and then the gospel uh, reenacted. Okay. You know, there's so many ways you can describe uh, these matters. But when he speaks of the gospel enacted, he's talking about the, basically the facts of the gospel. The gospel is enacted by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But it's reenacted. That is, we come in contact with, those, with that wonderful act of love. Uh, through dying to sin and through being buried in water and then raised to walk in newness of life. Jesus was brought back by the power of God. He walked around on this earth for 40 days, alive as ever. People eating with him, talking with him, listening to him, learning from him. And then they watched him go back up into the sky. Just alive by the power of God. Even so, even so, through Christ, we who are dead in sin, we can die to sin by being buried in water, which reenacts, in a sense, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We die to sin. We're buried in water, raised to walk in newness of life. God gives us our spiritual life back, just like he gave Christ his, his physical life back. He overcome death. He broke the, the, uh, the boundaries of death. And he came back to life so God can bring us out of our spiritual death uh, as well. I was taught um, a similar way. Uh, I, would, I would listen a lot of times to my wife's uh, father who preached. And he would always talk about the facts, the commands, and the promises of the gospel. The facts of the gospel are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The commands of the gospel, of course, is hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithful. And then the promises of the gospel are so many. All these blessings in Christ, remission of sins, eternal life in Christ, uh, salvation in Christ, all the things that are found in Christ. And so many ways to explain this, but the reason there are so many ways to explain this is because the gospel is so fundamental and simple to uh, grasp. Romans 6, uh, 3 through 5, we read that. Now, uh, notice this question. Does the Bible describe the one baptism as a burial in water? Well, see, it does. And where do we get the benefits of the death of Jesus? In the baptism. We're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into the death of Christ. And it is in the death of Christ that he shed his blood. And you know uh, the blessings of that. If you are uh, baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? Well, of course not. No. If you are not baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? And that would be a yes. Do you want to take a chance on missing heaven? And... Um, no one wants to make it 
take that chance of missing heaven. No one. Try to imagine yourself, you're sitting down with someone, and these questions are getting very, very tender, and uh, oftentimes uh, people begin to you know, shed tears because they realize that the truth has been there, and this makes complete sense because we're not making up. There's no man's opinions being thrown in here at all. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You do. As we have seen Jesus commands uh, repentance, are you willing to start making the changes in your life that Jesus commands us to make and to live for God? Okay. Uh, most likely, a person's not going to stay with you this long in these booklets if they're not willing to answer yes to many of these. Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? If you were taught you had remission of sins before baptism, could you have been baptized for the remission of sins? That's a big question. Okay. And sometimes you will, you will stop and do some discussing right here. If you were taught that you had remission of sins before baptism, could you have been baptized for the remission of sins? What's the answer to that? If you were taught that you were saved before baptism, could you have been baptized to be saved? It's another no. Since God describes the one baptism as a burial in water, could you have been scripturally baptized if, you, if water was sprinkled or poured upon you? And so here's an important thought. You cannot be taught the wrong thing and obey the right thing. That would be something to write down somewhere in your booklet. Okay. You cannot be taught the wrong thing and obey the right thing. Obedience is not an accident. Okay. It's a good thing to remember. It's a good thing to share with someone if you don't have time. But it's, good. it's a good thought-provoking thought. Okay. You cannot be taught the wrong thing and obey the right thing. Obedience is never an accident. <clears throat> so, um, you cannot be scripturally baptized if water was sprinkled or poured upon you. Sometimes at this point, what I like to do, and of course this is all about your personality. Okay. I grew up playing baseball, so I just think in these terms. But a lot of times, I'll just take a, a little scrap piece of paper and I'll draw, you know, four base, I'll draw a baseball field. And I will say, you know, we need to cover all the bases of baptism. And there are four primary bases of baptism. Okay. First, you've got to have the right element, which is water. We're not baptized in the Holy Spirit like the apostles. You've got to have the right element, which is water. You've got to have the right action, which is a burial, not sprinkling or pouring. The right person has got to be baptized. You've got to have the right candidate to be baptized. You've got to have someone who, who believes in Jesus, the Son of God, and who's willing to repent, willing to commit, willing to make the good confession. Okay. You've got to have the right person. And then the final base, you hit a home run in baptism, you've got to, it's got to be done for the right purpose, for the remission of sins. Anything that you can do to kind of just illustrate or uh, help help someone think in the right uh, direction. And so more thought-provoking uh, questions. Have you been baptized? How old were you when you were baptized? Circle the word that describes your baptism. If you have been baptized, were you saved before or after uh, your baptism? Uh, if you were to die tonight, do you know that where you would spend uh, eternity. Yeah. Acts 22 and 16 is brought up here. Another little good parallel passage where Ananias tells, uh, tells Saul. Now, obviously Saul has now come to a belief in Jesus by him uh, not eating. Uh, for three days he's obviously in a, in a state of remorse. And um, so he's ready to hear the rest of the gospel. And Ananias comes and says, Why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 
Notice uh, the options given here. Option number one is to do it in this order. Call on the name of the Lord, have your sins forgiven, be saved, and then be baptized later. Or does option number two fit Acts 22, 16 better? To be baptized, have your sins washed away, be saved, and now in that process you're calling on the name of the Lord. Simple order of how the Lord has placed things in Scripture can go a long way. So notice that from Acts 22 and uh, verse 16. John 14, 15, more encouragement to obey. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So here's the question, if you really love Jesus, will we want to obey him? What's the answer? Do you love Jesus? Do you want to obey him? Since Jesus wants you to be baptized, and now that you understand the importance of being baptized, uh, right now, would, wouldn't you please Jesus for you to be baptized uh, right now? Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Jesus, the end question is, Jesus is the savior of the what? Ephesians 1.22 and 23, the Lord has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Then the church is also called the what? Ephesians 4 verse 4 says there is one what? There's one body and one spirit even as you're called and one hope of your calling. So how many bodies are there? Spiritually, one body. Do you want to be in the church or body of Christ that has, he has promised to save? Yes, you do want to be in that. So how do you get into that body? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body? whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. How does one get into the Lord's church? And do you want Jesus to add you to his church? And when would you want that to happen? More encouragement to obey. James 4, 13 and 14. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and we'll continue there a year and we will buy and sell and get gain, get grain. Uh, whereas you know not uh, what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's even as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Do you know for certain that you'll be alive tomorrow? This is encouragement to obey. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? And do you want to go to heaven when you die? That must be a yes for everyone. More encouragement, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Paul saying, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Uh, behold, now is the day of salvation. When is the accepted time? Now. When is the day of salvation? And has God, has God promised you or any of us another day to make things right with Him? When should you be baptized into Christ? And are you ready to be baptized uh, right now? So the good thing is that you're sitting with someone and they're reading this for themselves and you're not just saying just a whole lot. And the very words themselves are convicting uh, someone with a good and humble heart. <clears throat> Revelation 14, 11 is also an encouragement. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Will those in hell be tormented forever and ever? Or will they ever have any rest? 
Do you want to suffer with him forever and ever in that awful place? And so what is happening here is two modes of encouragement. The goodness of God, but also the severity of God. Romans 11, 22 mentions uh, both. Revelation 20, verse 15. Whoever was not found written in the uh, book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If any was not found written in the book of life, he was done what? What happened? Cast in the lake of fire. Is your name written in the book of life? And do you want God to write your name in the book of life? Sure you do. What must you do to have your name recorded in God's book of life? Must obey. Do you want him to write it there right now? Matthew 12, verse 30. He that is not with me, Jesus says, is against me. And he that gathers uh, not with me scatters abroad. Jesus said, if we are not with him, we are what? We are against him. This means that we are either on the Lord's side or Satan's side. This means that we're either helping the cause of Jesus or we're helping the cause of Satan. On which side do you want your name written? And then that is an appropriate way of ending the discussion. As we look at Hebrews 5 verse 9, being made perfect, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Jesus will save those who obey him. Are you ready to obey Jesus' command to be baptized? Must we obey Jesus to be saved eternally? Yes, we are. Yes, we must. Will you obey him? Uh, Revelation 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Must we follow Jesus faithfully to be saved eternally? Yes, we must. That's part of our commitment that we're making to Christ at this time. Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So must we put God first in our lives? We must. This is all part of that commitment that one is making as he is making his way to salvation in Christ. Will you promise to put God first uh, in your life? And that is up to each uh, individual. Hebrews 10.25 mentions that being faithful in attendance, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see of the day approaching. Must Christians be faithful in attendance uh, to the assemblies of the church? Yes. Will you be faithful in attending the service of the Lord's church? And after you are baptized into Christ, where do you plan uh, to worship? I like that because when we're baptized into Christ, that is just the beginning. That is the beginning of our journey. That's the beginning of our uh, service uh, to Jesus. It is the beginning of our walk uh, with Christ, we now have a responsibility and we have a privilege of serving the Lord and reaching out uh, to others and honoring the Lord uh, in worship. I passed out this additional paper here that lists the conversions found in the book of Acts and we'll see that what God required of people in one location, He also required required of others. The conditions of salvation are given to the whole world. Jesus said, go into all the world, all the world, and preach the gospel. An important concept there, of course, is we know that God is no respecter of persons. He will not require one person to meet a certain set of conditions and then allow another person to go a different way and also receive salvation. The same conditions were spelled out for those in Jerusalem as were spelled out for those in Athens. The same conditions were given out to the jailer as was given out uh, to Lydia and her household. The same conditions were, gone, were preached in Corinth, that corrupt city, as was preached in that holy city, uh, Jerusalem. The same conditions of salvation must be taken to Washington, D.C. and to 
uh, Los Angeles, California, and up to Canada, Mexico, and everywhere in between. There are no exceptions, no matter what position in life. So here we are. God is no respecter of persons. And so, so much that we can share with other people, and these booklets help us to do uh, just that. You will find a way, as you get started uh, with these booklets, you will find a way, mostly, you will just need to be silent and let the Word of God uh, do the talking. One of the hardest things we face is to get out of the way. Stay out of the way. We just want to be a link between uh, someone needing salvation and the Lord who can offer salvation, and we need to keep ourselves out of the way. So this evening, we also, as we always do, we offer salvation. It's not really us offering it, it's the, it's the Lord offering it. It's, he offers it all the time. His big old arms are spread out before us, before the whole world. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. If we can assist you with gospel salvation this evening, please make that known right now as we stand together and as we sing. Brother John.
uh, observing the Lord's Supper today, if you need to, to, to partake of that, please make your way to our foyer area, to our conference room, and there'll be some men there ready to serve uh, those emblems uh, here in just a moment during this last song. We are glad to be together this evening. Also remember our food delivery uh, program on Monday evenings at 4. Men's class uh, follows that up at about 6.30. We look forward to being back here Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock as well. It's all yours, brother. Number 401, the Lord bless you and keep you for our final song this evening. to our Heavenly Father in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we come before Thee as we prepare to go in our separate ways. We pray, O oh Lord, that You'll bless us each and every way. Give us the strength to live as good Christians, to be an example to others, and always be aware of the things we say and do so that we do not cause someone to stumble and fall. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'll be with us throughout this week. Be those that are, be with us, those of us that are sick. We pray that you'll be with the, those across the world that have the different types of illnesses that can be held so that the, those that pertain and provide the services to them will be able to bring them back to their normal health. We thank thee for our ability to be at a church in a congregation like this that we can receive the truth and know that we are being led in a way which will help us to be with thee in the eternal life. We also pray, dear Lord, that you'll help those that are not um, um, among our members, that they be able to understand the importance of becoming one of the foe, and that they will allow us to have a chance to Teach them the things that they need to be able to be one of that people. As we go through this life, be with us now and forevermore. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Those of uh, group number A, please remember to meet in the auditorium with Houston. Those of group number A, please remember your meeting with Houston in the auditorium. Those of you uh, not part of the group, we ask you to go on out into the foyer uh, to do your talking.